Oftentimes when you hear people talk about stock, what they're talking about is common stock. And that's the most common type of stock out there, which is kind of ties in with the name common stock. But when somebody says, I want to buy 100 shares of Apple or 100 shares of Microsoft or 100 shares of IBM, what they're talking about is buying shares of the common stock. Some of the basic characteristics of common stock. First of all, voting rights. When you buy shares of common stock, you become a part owner in the company. You own a piece of the company. For instance, in my personal stock portfolio, I own a whopping 40 shares of McDonald's stock currently, which means I'm a part owner of McDonald's. Now, McDonald's has so many shares outstanding that my ownership interest is almost non-existent, but I still am a part owner. That ownership allows me the opportunity to vote on board of directors when they come up for re-election, as well as any other major issues that would be available. For instance, if McDonald's was being acquired by another company, I would be able to vote on whether I thought that was a good idea. If McDonald's was considering authorizing new shares to issue, I would be able to vote on that. My vote would be swamped out by the millions and millions and millions of other shares out there, but I would still have that opportunity as a common stockholder. Common stock dividends are variable and set based on profitability, financing needs, and the perspective of the board. What that means is unlike preferred stock, we don't get a fixed set dividend every year. Our dividends are going to vary over time. Typically, those dividends will increase over time but sometimes they'll have to be cut or stopped when the company is struggling. In 2007 and 2008, we saw the U.S. economy, actually the world economy, enter one of the most severe recessions since the Great Depression. And during that time, a lot of companies that had paid dividends for decades and increased those dividends every year like clockwork for decades, ended up cutting dividends or in some cases stopping them entirely to try to survive through those tough economic time periods. So when companies are setting dividends, they don't like to cut them, but they will cut them if they really feel they need all that capital available to keep the company alive. They don't want to distribute it back out to shareholders at that point. So typically as they're more and more profitable, they will slowly increase dividends and dividends will be some percentage of current income. Typically that percentage is not adjusted year to year because income tends to be very vari variable, but the company will set kind of a target that over an average in the next couple of years, we want to try and pay out 25% or 40% or 50% of our earnings in the form of dividends and keep the rest to finance operations. Common stockholders have a claim to the profits of the firm, but are not obligated to receive dividends. Kind of ties in with what we're talking about, the dividend issue above. As a common stockholder, you own the company, so you own the profits of the company. In my example before, I mentioned I own 40 shares of McDonald's. So when McDonald's makes money, I get a piece of that money. I have a claim against it. McDonald's, though, is not obligated to pay that out in dividends. They could decide it's in their interest to keep the money reinvested in expanding their operations, developing new product lines, whatever they want to invest that money in. So I have a claim against the profits, but I don't have to receive those profits as dividends. Now, the good news for me as a shareholder is assuming the company is doing a good job of managing its money, even though it doesn't pay those dividends to me in the form of dividends, it hopefully will be reinvesting them profitably so the value of my stock will increase over time. Common stockholders are the last to receive payment beyond or behind bondholders or other creditors and preferred stockholders in the event of bankruptcy. So if the company goes bankrupt as a stockholder, most likely my stock is going to become worthless. There's typically not anything left over to distribute to me. It also means that my dividends are last in line. 
So I'm not going to get paid dividends if we can't meet the coupon payments and preferred dividends that the company has been issued. So common stock gives me ownership rights. I should receive dividends, but those dividends are going to be variable. Some companies pay dividends. Some companies choose not to pay dividends and reinvest all that money into the company. So there's no obligation for me to receive dividends. And that dividend cash flow stream is quite a bit riskier than the coupon payment I get on bonds or the dividends on preferred because it's variable in nature and I'm the last in line to receive that payment. Now there are several stock valuation models that people use in practice. I've even seen reports of people that use astrology and things like that in order to help them decide when the best time to buy stocks is, when the time to avoid stocks is. Lots of people use number patterns. There's things called Fibonacci retracements and all kinds of different things that get used in discussing stock valuations. However, what we're going to focus on in this class is a set of models called dividend discount models. Just like we use for preferred stock, we're going to forecast the dividends and find the present value of those dividends. When we're dealing with constant growth, and this is the simplest stock pricing model, we just want to take the year one dividend, D1, and divide by the required return minus the growth rate. What that does is that gives us the present value of all the expected dividends. It's a mathematically derived model that just takes the present value of all dividends, assuming those dividends are growing at a constant rate year after year. So we're going to work through an example real quick. We're considering the purchase of a stock that just paid a dividend of $3. Dividends are forecasted to grow at a 5% rate for the foreseeable future and refill that an 11.5% required return is appropriate for this investment. Based on all this, what is the value of the stock? So now we're using our model, P0 equals D1 divided by K minus G. Dividend year one, required return, growth rate. Now, in this example problem, we weren't given D1, we were given D0, the current dividend. So we have to forecast D1. Now we know that D1 is equal to the current dividend times 1 plus the growth rate. And in this case, our growth rate was 5%. So our D1 is $3.15. So now we can go back to our model, $3.15, divided by the required return. The required return was that 11.5% required return. Plug that in as a decimal, 0.115, minus the growth rate. The growth rate we said was 5%. Again, plug that in as a decimal. And now all we have to do is solve the problem. 3.15 is our D1 divided by the required return minus the growth rate. Required return minus the growth rate is 6.5%. And that gives us a value of $48.46. So based on our assumptions, we know this stock is worth $48.46. That's the maximum we should be willing to pay for the stock. 